Hey everyone, Joshua Kirk here with you once again. Now it's time for episode 199 of Album of the Day, uh, in which uh, this is my last review that's right before my, tw my 200th album review here on my YouTube channel. Uh, channel, which uh, uh, for my 199 second, so for my uh, 100... Uh, 99th uh, album review. Uh, I'm going to be uh, reviewing the latest album from a band that, if you've watched my channel for years, you know I'm a pretty big fan of this group. Uh, group uh, since I've uh, developed uh, actually uh, a true uh, relationship with them, as well as uh, a big fan of their music. Uh, music. This is a band out of Philadelphia, uh, and the band is called Dr. Dog, uh, a band that I've uh, been a fan of pretty much since late 2012. Uh, and I'm here to review their latest album, which came out on April 27th this year in 2018. And the album is called Critical Equation. And as you can see, I own it on vinyl. I bought this at a Soundgarden, the Soundgarden in Baltimore, one of my favorite record stores, which I highly recommend. If you're in town in Fells Point, definitely check that place out. And sorry if I sound a little croaky in this video. It's just I'm suffering from a cold right now, but you know it's okay. Um, and this is on uh, the band's own record label, uh, We Buy Gold, which also put out uh, the band's previous record, uh, the surprise album, Abandoned Mansion, which is the previous. Dr. Dog out my review, just as probably you would think. Um, uh, but it's like uh, marketed and distributed by 30 Tigers, a, a label known for uh, signing a bunch of different Americana artists, including Jason Isbell. There's the back. Uh, really nice drawings of all the band members. And I like how the colors on their shirts are also kind of uh, the color keys uh, for all of them. So like whatever key it is, key it is for the band, uh, that's the color of their shirts as well. Ten songs on the album. It's over uh, 41 minutes and as you can see there's a different track listing here on the vinyl than there is on the digital version which I actually listened to the just the digital copy of the album off of my iPod. Uh, because that's the kind of track listing order that I wanted to use to prepare for this review. Um, and they worked with an outside producer for the first time on this album. Uh, actually, not really for the first time, but it's like a pretty significant time of their career in which they've worked with one. Uh, they worked with Gus Seyfert, who's pretty well known for his work with artists such as Beck, Bedouin, and Michael Kinawaka. There's side A, and then there's side B. And uh, this is just regular black vinyl. No, like, uh, extra bells and whistles going on in here. But it does include a poster of the album cover, which I think is pretty awesome. So I might have to put this up on my wall sometime. Yeah, and that's uh, the vinyl for uh, Dr. Dog's new album, Critical Equation. Now, Dr. Dog uh, has... Now, I do think that Dr. Dog's most recent output has definitely been some of their most versatile uh, to work to date. Uh, we had kind of the stripped back and soulful B room, uh, the highly experimental rough around the edges and conceptual the psychedelic swamp remake, and uh, the as well as the folky back porch pop of Abandoned Mansion. Uh, but with this new album, uh, they've uh, definitely uh, sort of gone back to their roots somewhat, but at the same time definitely 
sounding like a whole new Dr. Dog here on this record. And I think the Gus Safer, the Gus Safer polished production on this album definitely uh, sort of uh, sort of uh, displays that. Like on the opening track, Listening In, which I think is a really good song, really great opener for the album, uh, and uh, it definitely uh, and it definitely does see the band really kind of uh, experimenting a little more with its kind of weird off-kilter keyboards, uh, the Soulful Bridge, which uh, is a really cool tempo change uh, towards the end of the song. Um, End of the song, and Scott McMicken is singing with his vocals uh, sort of uh, delayed with a space echo effect. Uh, go effect. Like, it still definitely sounds very much like uh, Dr. Dog uh, with its kind of, with its very uh, earwormy riff, uh, along <laughs> kind of earwormy guitar riff, and uh, really nice steady bass line and drumming. Uh, drumming, but definitely uh, a lot more kind of like uh, bells and whistles to uh, kind of surprise the listener. Uh, but it's good to see uh, a more revitalized kind of fresh Dr. Dog than anything we've heard from them before. Um, them before and the songs kind of simple lyrics do kind of fit in with these grooves really nicely. Um, I would say this album is probably one of the easiest albums to comprehend lyrically for the band. Even at, I mean, even at this album's most nonsensical lyrically moments, like the song Go Out Fighting is probably the closest that it comes to that sort of uh, lyrical uh, approach. But, approach, but even there, we still definitely do get a really good idea of what... Uh, the singer is trying to make a point of here, um, point of here, and I also love this track because uh, I love uh, love how catchy it is. I love the refrain, "Go out fighting." It just gets stuck in your head, get in your head, and fits very well over the kind of playful organ line, in line. And Eric Slick's drumming on the song definitely syncopates with it very nicely. Um, Nicely, and then of course the song has that really outstanding psychedelic guitar solo towards the middle. <clears throat> but, but towards the middle, it's the middle. Uh, the track "Buzzing in the Light" is "Singing in the Light" is one of the quiet is one of the quieter tracks on this album, but definitely easily one of the most compelling on here on here, I mean the melody on this track is definitely one of the most uh, well crafted on here and really to show that the band still has uh, has uh, definitely uh, the chops to create a very uh, memorable uh, a very simple yet very effective melody um, effective melody like uh, the sound of the organ on this and I, and I like how every song on this record pretty much sounds like the band like recorded it live as well. Like this is one of the few songs that, for example, has like very little overdubs going on on the track. A lot of it's performed live from so from that sexy organ lick along with the like uh, along with the drums, which sound like they were recorded in a really nice room where there's the perfect amount of reverb and stuff like that. Stuff like that. And then of course uh, there's the really uh, beautiful uh, soulful vocal performance from Toby Lehman here. Uh, B. Lehman here, which makes it oh uh, so satisfying when he says stuff like a swarm of bees, they form a pillow under me, buzzing in the light, uh, buzzing in the light of this world. Another song where the lyrics are kind of nonsensical, but at the same time you do kind of get a good idea of, uh, you know, sort of, uh, kind of the sort of uh, optimism that the narrator is feeling on this track. Um, track. And then we have the track Virginia Please, which uh, is 
Virginia Please, which has this really cool sort of strange, uh, strange hypnotic melody that opens up the song that's sort of created by uh, some instruments such as harpsichord, and I think I heard Celeste in there as well. Well, Zach Miller really kind of exp uh, sort of exploring a bunch of stuff in keyboard world here. Um, board world here, and also it does have a, a really cool bass line on it, uh, line on it, but then the melody changes to something a little more, uh, a little more jaunty, uh, to even as the song does sort of address a relationship that's sort of fallen apart, and, uh, he, and, and he's sort of feeling a sense of confusion, and Uh, the sort of confusion that he feels, uh, but he somehow still uh, really does have some empathy for her, even as she's doing things that he doesn't uh, want her to, like to like becoming a stoner and stuff like that, uh, like that. So there's definitely some very smart lyrics going on here on this track, uh, along with it being one of the catchiest songs here on the album. I mean, it does have that really cool sort of smile-inducing harpsichord solo in the middle, which I think sounds very nice on there. Hmm. Nice, and, and the way that the harmonies are layered on this track sounds really nice, uh, like on the ending mantra of Virginia, please, I'm on my knees underwater. Underwater. And then we have the title track, which is definitely uh, sort of rooted a little bit in soul, almost, on this track. Kind of like the band's opener off of B-Room, The Truth. Uh, uh, the Truth, which is one of my favorite tracks off of that LP. Um, the, uh, this track uh, definitely... Uh, uh, this track uh, definitely has uh, plenty of uh, character to it. It definitely sounds like soul a little bit with its very, uh, with its very beautiful organ, this very beautiful sort of clicking organ chords on the track. Uh, track along with its kind of uh, very kind of intricate uh, drumming. I mean, even though it does have other elements that kind of set it apart a little bit, like the kind of space echo effects on Scott McMicken's voice and the chorus. Hit the chorus that kind of uh, create this kind of interesting kind of uh, six second loop, uh, especially uh, towards the end of the song if you listen very closely with headphones, which is how I prefer to listen to my music anyway. Music anyway. Uh, and this is another song that sort of uh, talks about uh, kind of uh, it's about sort of uh, kind of the the hardships of like making a balance in relationships and stuff like that. Really, the whole critical equation demeanor can be uh, applied to anything, whether it be like whether it be like uh, trying to do something uh, with purpose in your life. Or trying to, you know, sort of keep your relationship glued together, and it really does apply to this album really well. This is a band where the the equation of uh, where the equation of uh, rough and lo-fi elements and polished, well-produced elements is definitely very critical here. Um, uh, critical here, so that this song I think uh, really defines this record really well. Uh, and then we have uh, another Toby Lehman composition, True Love, which is uh, kind of like this fun sort of like uh, like con almost like uh, alternative country folk sort of song that definitely has a very kind of fun summery sort of vibe to it with its very optimistic uh, acoustic guitar. Optimistic acoustic guitar, uh, and then we, and then and Toby Lehman sounds like very vocally confident on this track. This is definitely one of the most laid back moments on the entire record. <clears throat> uh, 
on this record, and uh, the lyrical content does show, uh, like, uh, Toby Lehman trying to, uh, uh, trying to find, uh, true love, but, uh, yet still, uh, not really feeling quite ready for it, uh, because he feels he's been under false impressions his whole life, um, <coughs> excuse me, whole life, so I definitely feel this is probably the band's most opt optimistic record to date, both musically, uh, and lyrically, uh, even if it does address some kind of dark topics, uh, it's good to see the band sort of, uh, sort of progressing as lyricists here on this album. <laughs> this album, and also fantastic chorus on this track too, uh, and also some of the other instrumental attention to detail they take to the song, like it's kind of, uh, like it's, like it's very kind of persistent xylophone, uh, like the kind of persistent xylophone, uh, as well as, uh, as well as that kind of psychedelic harpsichord that occurs uh, uh, towards the end of the song. I mean, the band makes really good use of the harpsichord here on this album. I mean, the instrument pops up more on this record than it ever has. Uh, has, but the way they use it throughout this album is definitely very well done. Um, however, following this track is a little bit of a lull for me, the track Heart, the track Heart Killer which uh, the first time I heard it, I thought it was pretty good, but the more I listen to it, the more I kind of get tired of it. Get tired of it, I mean, uh, I mean, the verses, I think, sound pretty good. Uh, pretty good. The intro is a little off-putting because it's, like, really kind of so in your face that it's kind of, it comes off as being a bit obnoxious. Uh, and I'd say the same for the chorus, too. It's chorus, uh, it's kind of so repetitive to the point where it kind of gets a, a little annoying, in my opinion. Eh. Uh, a little annoying, in my opinion. So this is kind of the track where the band tried really hard to create a very catchy, bombastic indie rock song, but then it just kind of fell through the cracks and just, co just coming off as the band just doing a little too much for me. <coughs> little too much for me, uh, but this lull doesn't last for too long. Uh, we get into one of the most beautiful tracks on the record, Night, which is definitely, like, uh, very, like, by far the band's, by far uh, one of the most kind of, like, soothing and meditative songs that the band has ever written. I mean, it's kind of atmospheric uh, production, uh, kind of reminds me, it's atmospheric, psych folk production uh, actually kind of reminds me a little bit of the approach that Ray LaMontagne took on his 2016 record or or Burroughs, which was a record that I really liked from 2016. Um, 16, uh, I say meditative for this song because this is kind of a song that sort of meditates on how night kind of uh, is a time of day that kind of feels like yours and uh, you feel like no one's like paying attention to you and you're just like at peace uh, and it's like very beautiful and satisfying the poeticisms of the lyrics of uh, like sort of uh, you know getting rid of the sun in favor for the moonshine um, moonshine uh, shine it's a kind of sort of sentiment that at first when you hear it you may be like what uh, but the more you listen to it, the more you kind of find yourself just really drawn uh, to drawn to the sort of introspection of this particular track. And the production on the song sounds fantastic. Uh, stick as well. I love its kind of uh, I love its kind of colorful, uh, watery splashes of keyboards that sort of whoosh in. Hmm? That sort of uh, whoosh in, almost like the wind, a little bit. Uh, that on the track, that was definitely a very nice element over its uh, uh, over the more straight ahead folk groove that it goes into. Uh, go to, and it also has a really nice kind of uh, egg, really nice kind of out of tune piano on the track too. Uh, Track two, uh, 
Next, we have uh, the track uh, Under the Wheels, which is the third and final Toby composition on the album. And it opens up with uh, this, like, very beautiful sort of, like, uh, layering of voices, which sounds like all of their voices sort of stacked up and double-tracked and stuff like that to make it sound very kind of, like... It actually kind of reminds me a little bit, like... Uh, it actually reminds me a little bit of like a meditative tribal chant almost uh, before it eventually goes into uh, into kind of this fun sort of uh, sort of country tinged indie rock track, uh, which actually that combination really works here on this track. Uh, it's on this track uh, a really good hooky guitar riff on the track. Uh, track and it's like very re and it's recorded very nicely where you can actually hear one guitar pretty much on each ear which is pretty nice uh, mm -hmm. here uh, that's pretty nice uh, I saw it and uh, nice and lyrically uh, this track uh, sort of uh, reflects on uh, stuff such as uh, jazz uh, uh, what what his family believed in and stuff like then and stuff like that uh, and uh, how that sort of helped him uh, through life but at the same time he still kind of feels like uh, he's uh, but he still at times feels kind of like uh, that random someone who's kind of like uh, greasing the wheel uh, seeing the wheel and stuff like that uh, definitely, uh, like, very poetic, uh, smart lyrics on this track. Uh, and then the album closes with what's probably my favorite track on the record, Coming Out of the Darkness. I mean, one of the catchiest hooks on the entire record that uh, will definitely have you uh, singing along, for sure. Um, so, and uh, you may think, and uh, you could see from the title that this is definitely yet another... Uh, uh, it's a sign that the band is sort of progressing and uh, finally finding a new purpose in life, uh, which uh, you can hear in the lyrics a little bit, little bit, and the production on this song sounds really cool as well. Uh, well, that beautiful harpsichord, uh, that harpsichord that really syncopates nicely with the bass and drums on the track. Uh, track and there's some really cool guitar things going on I mean there's even uh, a funny point like towards the end of that instrumental break where I I hear like uh, the guitar uh, being put through a wah-wah pedal so it sounds very kind of like uh, so it has this very cool sort of like a uh, wow sound that uh, sound that if you listen very carefully you'll see it as like a very funny, satisfying end to that instrumental break, uh, which before that is a really interesting bridge, a uh, bridge where it's basically like purely like synthesizers and keyboards. I mean, the layering and attention to detail on this album really to show that Gus Seyfert really did a good job of helping the band sort of get out of their comfort zone a little bit and trying new cool ideas while still sort of maintaining their skills as musicians. Um, <laughs> skills as musicians. So yeah, overall I'm definitely very much digging this album. I think, in my opinion, it's probably their most masterful record since 2013's B Room. Even though I thought Abandoned Mansion was uh, definitely a really good album, as you may see from my positive review from last year of that album. Uh, <clears throat> Excuse of that album, uh, album, uh, Psychedelic Swamp, where you make a little underwhelming, in my opinion, even though there were gems on there, uh, but, like, Critical Equation is definitely a good, much-needed step forward for the band, uh, band, because you kind of have to, uh, sort of get out of your comfort zone and evolve as a band, or otherwise, uh, no one's really going to want to listen to your music anymore, and, Otherwise, uh, you know, your music is just going to come off as boring if you just keep rehashing it. So, the fact that Dr. Dog uh, decided to record in L.A. instead of Philly, and 
Philly and the fact that uh, the band is sort of, uh, you know, becoming a little more optimistic and mature as songwriters and now finally really taking their music seriously. Uh, so, like, the fact that this is all happening for this one album is definitely very rewarding. So, I'm definitely going to give Critical Equation an 8 out of 10 for sure. One of my favorite indie records of the year. So, like, uh, if you've been a fan for years, uh, I think you're going to really like what's on here. Uh, anyway, that's uh, my review for this album, and I'll see you for Review 200. It's going to be a big one, trust me.